Imagine a quantum computer with 1 million physical qubits in 50 square millimeters. Hello and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Kassir. Quantum Art says they're building quantum computers with modular two-dimensional structures that will enable 100 times more parallel operations, 100 times more gates per second, and a footprint that's up to 50 times smaller than leading quantum competitors. That's 50 square millimeters. It's about the size of a button on my shirt or a pencil eraser tip. It's tiny. And they're planning to do that by 2033. Today we're chatting with the CEO. His name is Tal David. Welcome, Tal. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me, John. Thank you for coming. You're on vacation. You're hiking and biking and probably kayaking all over Alaska. Now you're in Washington State heading to Olympic Park. Thank you for taking some time on this vacation when we're in the same time zone to chat. I'm super pumped about this. Before we get into the details of what makes your quantum computer different or four key technological pillars you're built on, all that stuff and physical qubits, logical qubits, all that stuff. What's your big vision? You've got a massive set of goals for 2033. Yeah, so when we set out to uh, form Quantum Art three and a half years ago, we wanted to have impact. Impact in three different aspects. One in business, of course, to make a whole lot of money out of this. Second is impact to humanity and really influence everyday lives of people on the planet by enabling compute to solve problems on a big scale. And third, coming out of Israel, we wanted to have an Israeli capability at the forefront of the quantum space uh, for our nation. Mm -hmm. So this is what we set out to do. And the differentiator between all of the players in the industry is in how you take the small systems that we have today and scale them up into meaningful systems that could solve commercially viable applications at scale. And this is what we set out to do. Cool. Okay, big vision four key technological pillars that differentiate you. Uh, I'm just going to name them and explain them like we're five, explain them, you know, in ordinary language, if that's possible. We're talking quantum computing. It's, it's challenging stuff, right? So the first one that you've got, they think is different and a differentiator is you've got multi-qubit gates that are capable of executing the equivalent of up to a thousand two-qubit operations in a single step. What is that? Yeah. So uh, just as a general headline, we looked at the shortcomings of other approaches and we identified that these shortcomings are really up to two main things. First, the speed of operations in trapped on quantum computing, and then the scale of the QPU size. Uh, the first thing that we set out to do is these multi-qubit gates uh, that essentially, instead of doing what the industry is doing for many, many years, uh, single operations on single qubits or two qubits, one after the other in sequence, like I play my guitar note by note, we said, okay, we can go beyond that, right? We can uh, uh, interact with our lasers in a special spectral engineering modulation and interact with tens of qubits at once, thereby doing all of the possible pairs instead of one by one, uh, we're doing them in a single physical operation. So instead of, of playing my guitar note by note, we play chords, if you'd wow. like to say. So this saves a whole lot of time because we're doing many, many operations at once and it saves us a lot of errors and it's kind of difficult to design, but we've found a way of how to do that and implement that. And this is kind of special for us. Yes. Super cool. Second key differentiator, optical segmentation of long ion chains into independently operating cores using laser defined boundaries. What's that? Yeah. So what usually people do after 50, 60 physical qubits and trapped ions, start to become a very difficult control problem. And then they segment their QPU into different traps located in, in different places in, in space. And then we'll talk in a minute about how they connect information between these segments. What we do is a little bit different. We take a very long ion chain, let's say a thousand ions in each of these chains, and we optically segment it using lasers, what people call in the industry optical tweezers that pinpoint to place a couple of ions here and pinpoint to place a couple of ions there and do not allow them to move, thereby these ions now become barriers. And in between these barriers, we're defining segments of, let's say, a few tens of qubits each or cores that can work in parallel to each other in a very effective way. So we're moving from one register of, let's say, 50 qubits to a 1,000 ion chain separated into 20 cores of 50 qubits each working in parallel and without cross to each other. Huh. Is that related to fault tolerance? Oh, it will be related to fault tolerance because... Essentially, the um, optical segmentation worked, it, worked itself quite 
nicely to do error correcting codes because we can use the tweezed ions that are not playing in the data game as ancilla qubits to do mid separate measurements in order to implement error correcting protocols. So cool. in one step of a multi qubit gate on each of these cores, we move from the physical realism to the logical realism. And then we'll talk in a second about in one other step, we reconfigure and make uh, operations between these cores in a very, very efficient way. Exactly. Perfect segue. That's the third thing that you've said in your in some of your press materials. That's a differentiator. Dynamic reconfiguration of multi-core arrays for rapid entang entanglement generation and distribution. Talk about that. Yeah. So what usually people do when they have separate ion traps, they physically move or shuttle qubits from one trap to another in order to connect them and do logical operations between them. But this takes a whole lot of time. It could be 98% of the compiling time spent on moving and recooling these ions instead of doing calculations. And secondly, it increases the QPU size by a lot because you're not the, the length scale that determines the size of the QPU now is not the length scale of how qubits can be brought close together, which is a few micrometers. It's rather the size of the traps, which could be even a thousand fold larger. So it, it becomes prohibitively large as you scale up. So what we do, instead of moving the ions around, we're moving the information around. You huh. remember that we do optical segmentation in, in order to realize these multi-cores, and lasers are really easily turned on and off in a microsecond time. So instead of moving the, the ions around, we're just shutting off the tweezers uh, in one configuration and turning them on in a new configuration, thereby taking, let's say, half of one core and half of another core and making them into a new, immediately all-to-all -all connected core. And we're doing that not only at a single core at a time, but on all of the multi-cores. So in one reconfiguration step at a microsecond, much smaller than the gate time, we can connect hundreds and hundreds of qubits together. And if you would like to have an analogy for that, it's kind of reminiscent of how an FPGA works in electronics, right? In an FPGA, you have a certain configuration of the hardware, and then you give a command and you reconfigure how the hardware is organized. So we are doing that with reconfiguring the lasers thereby reorganizing how the qubits are connected together in a very, very massive way. And this also comes back to the error correcting protocols because, as we said, we could use the tweezed ions to do mid-circuit measurements to detect the, the errors. And when we're doing the reconfiguration test, we're doing logical operations between logical qubits encoded in these multi-cores. Mm -hmm. Talk about a total rethinking of how a computer works, right? <laughs> Reconfiguring the computer, the CPU, the, the QPU uh, dynamically uh, in milliseconds, maybe microseconds to do the jobs. It's insane. It's crazy. It's wonderful. Fourth thing, modular high density two dimensional structures that allow physical qubits to scale efficiently within compact footprints. What's that? Yeah. So as I said, the length scale is determined by how close you bring the qubits together. And as we're not shuttling them around, that's the length scale. So a thousand ion um, a chain like that is at the length of about five millimeters only. So now if you take a few of those 1000 ion registers and you assemble them into a mesh of rows and columns, you can get to extremely dense two dimensional arrays. Okay, uh, at the end of our roadmap, we're going to a million qubits in a 50 by 50 or two inch by two inch footprint which I think is one of the highest density QPUs out there, if not the highest. And this is really important. The implication here means that we can go to such high qubit count without mm -hmm. the need to connect different systems together. If you look at other modalities, uh, for example, superconducting qubits, when they go to about 128 uh, qubits in their dilution refrigerator, they're running out of room in that. And then they need to couple different refrigerators together, and this becomes both a technological challenge and also larger size, larger energy consumption, and essentially mm. higher cost systems to the user. For us, mm. we have a viable roadmap to go to a million qubits in a very small footprint and not having to deal with these interconnecting challenges at all. Amazing. What's the total size? So, I mean, where the qubits are is very, very small. What's the total size of your machine that you project? Yeah, so that's a good question. For us, it's, uh, it will be four or five 19 inch racks in a data center. You can imagine a couple of racks for the physical system, the vacuum chamber and the cryo are holding the iron trap. And around that you have a rack for lasers, a rack for electronics, and that's about it. So it's four or five uh, 19 inch racks. And in terms of energy consumption, we're talking about a few tens of kilowatts. It's not super high, uh, so it's quite nice.
That's insane. That just fits right into our current kind of ecosystem of server farms, cloud and everything like that. Yeah, more, more than that, we're looking at, like all of the industry, of combining classical compute with quantum compute in the next few years as we scale up the power of uh, quantum computing. And so we really look at the hybrid operation of um, quantum computers in data centers or HPC centers or cloud providers with their classical CPU and GPU offering to have a holistic offering uh, mm -hmm. utilizing the best of all worlds as you need for your application. Mm -hmm. So let's let's take a bit of a step back and look take a broader look maybe. How many physical qubits do you need to build a single logical qubit? We've seen a lot of different answers to that, right? We've seen hundreds of thousands, we've seen thousands, tens of thousands, we've seen, you know, lower numbers. What do you think? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think it really has to do with two things. First, the base performance of your qubit modality. And second, what is your architecture as you scale up? So we are working with trapped ion qubits. This is the qubit modality that provably is leading the industry in base performance, be it the longest coherence times or the best gate fidelities, uh, the only modality with true all-to-all -all connectivity and the highest quantum volume. So this enables very good physical to logical ratio. And we've seen work by others with a ratio of one to six, one to eight, one to 16 or so. We are aiming with our error correcting protocols to about one to 10. And this is enabled by both the base performance that we have in trapped ion qubits. And on top of that, you add our multi-qubit gates and so on that we've discussed before that enable really um, uh, sophisticated error correcting protocols that utilize the full programmability that we have in order to connect each qubit to any qubit that we want at any time. So we have very uh, efficient error correcting protocols and very low overhead. That's um, a little mind blowing, honestly, 10 to one. You're talking about a system in 2033, your, what your projections are, that you'll have 100,000 logical qubits in. Yeah, roughly, That's... let's say tens of thousands at least. And even before that, when we're launching our next generation product in 2027, it will be 1,000 physical qubits up to 100 logical qubits. And this already will go beyond why class, what classical HPCs can do today. So this will be the starting point of what people call quantum advantage and commercial viability yeah. already in the next two, three years and not at the turn of, this, uh, of the decade. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's a little mind blowing, almost a little frightening <laughs> based on what it can do. Uh, let's, we'll get into that stuff and we'll get into some of the future stuff and applications and other things uh, momentarily. Uh, let's talk about fault tolerance. You've mentioned already in a couple of places, maybe sum up for us uh, your, your view of fault tolerance and how your computer, how your quantum computer will be fault tolerant. Yeah, so for sure, fault tolerance is the way to go. If you want to do real practical algorithms at scale, you need millions of qubits and many millions of code lines. In order to realize that, you have to be able to correct your errors as you go through the, uh, through the algorithm. And so it's really important to go to fault tolerance, to error correcting protocols, and implement these logical operations there. But having said that, if you have good performance at base scale, even before uh, uh, error correcting codes will be fully mature, there's a lot of value you could bring earlier in the game. And so mm -hmm. we're looking with customers and partners on use cases that go in both time scales. In the short time, what are the low hanging fruits that can bring value already in the near term? And then at the longer term, what are the things that you need to do in order to scale up enough in order to fully implement error correcting codes uh, and fault tolerant quantum computing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So super aggressive goals, right? I mean, you're talking uh, a million physical qubits, at least tens of thousands, maybe up to 100,000 logical qubits by 2033. And even before that, as you said, 2029, 2028, uh, 2030, quantum supremacy in some sense, or at least quantum advantage. Uh, how confident are you? Well, we have to be confident and optimistic in this field in order to, uh, to be able to succeed, right? We have extremely gifted competition, which is highly um, all over the uh, world. financed all over the world. The trap time community is quite tight knit and small. Everybody knows everyone. Uh, so we know who we're competing with and we have to go as fast as possible, as aggressive as possible in order not to miss the train. And uh, mm -hmm. this is what we set out to do. 
This is why we started out big. We only started, we're the youngest uh, uh, trap time company, maybe uh, started just three years ago, but we're now a team of, of almost 50 people with a few working uh, systems in the lab. And we have uh, spent our time now de-risking all of the conceptual risks of our special building blocks of the architecture. And going forward, now we need to bring all of these building blocks together and go to scale and the engineering challenges, which is, you know, there are challenges there, but they're not conceptual as much as they are engineering by. Okay, so recently there's been a lot of news, some significant people saying that quantum computing will never live up to its hype, never live up to its potential. What's your response to that? Yeah, I think it's really, really important not to overhype and not to oversell. The technology is evolving. It's evolving in a very accelerated pace in the last couple of years. You see people moving into the logic realism. You see people moving into real life applications. You see application demonstrations that are not only tailor made for what quantum could be better than classical, but actual uh, applications that are now on par or even going a little bit beyond what classical can do. So I think that uh, naysayers should just look at what's happening and see that we're getting there. The low hanging fruits are, are within sight around the corner. Uh, fault tolerance will take a bit more time but we're moving very fast toward that as an industry and also at quantum art. The last 10% always seems to be the hardest part. So as you look forward, what's the, what are the problems that you're most excited about solving with quantum computing? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I, as I said before, we set out to make an impact in the world. And so we want to tackle the big problems. We want to improve health and well-being. We want to improve people's security. We want to improve the efficiency and energy and sustainability of high compute problems. This is what we're setting out to do. And so, for example, our use cases that we're doing already today with uh, customers and partners are in the areas of aerospace and automotive and communication technologies, in the areas of quantum machine learning for image processing, uh, in the area of logistics optimizations and so on. These are the things that we're starting from, but the world is, is big. And there's a lot to do as we go on. Yeah, well, two things, actually. Uh, we really feel that we're making a work of art. You know, we're taking the systems to their utmost capabilities and not just building it out of small Lego bricks like everybody else is doing. And the innovation and creativity that is manifested in our approach and architecture really is, is artful. The other thing is that art happens to be the acronym of the three founders, Amit Ray and Tal, so that's kind of a nice play as well.